So as of yesterday, this is my wide body V8 swapped manual E30. And five months ago, it looked like this. And no, there is no engine and no gearbox in there. It is a total rolling shell. It has suspension, it has a diff. So how did we get here? How long did it take? What was the process? And would I ever do it again? <coughs> No, never. So let's go back to the day of picking it up. I got offered this E30 and it had a cage inside for a price I couldn't refuse. So what did I do? I didn't refuse. The first thing we're going to do is just pull the car in and we just started cleaning everything up. It had been sat outside under a cover, so it did start to get some surface rust on the floor and where the cage was. So the first port of call was to clean it all up and see if we needed to do any welding. Now, as far as E30s go, this was a really, really clean shell. There were a couple little bits that did need plating over, but I think in total, I had to weld in three plates just to cover some tiny little rust holes which had formed. And once I was happy with the shell, it's time to source an engine and a gearbox. So I actually found a GS6 BMW gearbox on Facebook Marketplace for around 250 quid. We like the BMW gearboxes. They're strong, cheap, and easy to get a hold of. Now the engine I wanted to go for was a 1UZ, which is a Toyota or a Lexus V8. They're cheap, reliable, and most importantly, you can actually buy engine mounts for this engine to fit in the E30. So we got an LS400 from Copart for 700 quid. It's only got 207,000. Barely ran in that. Now my plan was to keep the stock wiring and the stock ECU from the LS400 and just run everything off the original key, the original mobilizer and the original ECU. I wasn't going to go standalone. So what we had to do is we had to rip all the wiring out of the LS400 that we needed to keep. And once we had the wiring loom that we needed, it was time to take out the engine. Anti-roll bar I had to cut off in three different places. So how the hell are you meant to replace that? I have no idea. Well, there she is. As big as the BM. <laughs> it's as big as the BM. Now, obviously, all of these engines from factory come with an automatic gearbox, so it's time to rip that gearbox off, and we're gonna manual swap it with the BMW gearbox we picked up earlier. There we go. Now, there is a company in Poland who make an adapter plate and a custom flywheel for this exact swap. So that's another reason why I went with that gearbox earlier. Oh, she's coming along, oh my God. Now this kit pretty much came with everything I need, clutch, release bearing, flywheel, adapter plate. All we had to do was just cut a little bit off the gearbox so the original starter motor didn't hit it. And there is a manual gearbox on the One Use NVA. Now I didn't know it yet, but this is where things started to now get difficult. Now I actually bought some engine mounts that fit a 1UZ into an E30. Now although they did technically fit it into an E30, they definitely did not put the engine in the correct place. And the amount of fabrication work I had to do to get this engine in was honestly insane, but I'm sure we'll get to that. We've actually got the Powerflex mounts here. So we've got the um, engine mounts, which have sent me the Black Series. So we're gonna have the Black Series <laughs> engine mounts. I can buy some idling. No, I, I'm joking, they're not that bad. So now that we have some engine mounts applied by Powerflex, we can actually start putting the engine in. So first of all, I painted the bay, and while I was there, I painted the inside of the car as well. So not only did I have to modify these engine mounts brackets that were meant to fit this engine in the car, I also had to modify the subframe that was meant to fit these engine mounts on to fit this engine in the car. Now with the engine mounts on the actual engine, we can actually start putting the engine in the engine bay. Now this engine came in and out of the car at least 20 times because nothing would fit. Now the main reason it wouldn't fit because the steering knuckle on the E30 is absolutely massive and the manifold, no matter which way I put the engine in, was just hitting it. Disconnect this steering, at least then we can get the engine in, see what room we've got and see what we can put there. But this dampener is just hitting the manifold here, so we can't get that in. So right now I need to find a way to just disconnect this steering route, which is a bit of a pain, um, and then we can um, get the engine in. So once I got the engine in the car, I was eager to actually get it started and make sure it was actually starting to fire. So we actually started putting the whole wiring loom in the car in the same orientation as it was in the LS400. Uh, I'm really worried about the steering rack. You can order like some E30 slimline steering column things, but I don't even think they're gonna do the job. It's so close to the manifold. I'm getting really worried. And with the engine mounted up and the wiring actually in the car, we can actually start looking at giving the engine some fuel. Now the car didn't actually come with the fuel tanks. This was a good time to future-proof the car so we went with a fuel cell with a lift pump and we went with a swirl pot as well which has twin pumps so whatever we did with the car this setup would be good enough 
So after fitting the fuel cell in the boot, we actually got an E46 purple tag steering rack as well, which is a much faster rack than the standard E31. Now after buying, making and installing all my own fuel lines, it's time to give it a crank. Now the car wouldn't actually turn over using the key, so I went to the relays and I just breached the starter relay to make sure the starter was actually working. It's pretty scary. Right, well, it's cranking. <laughs> now, after about four sleepless nights of stress, we actually found out the reason why it wasn't starting on the key. Mate, Sam, you're the man. Oh my God. You don't understand how much stress this has been causing me. I almost just bought a Link ECU and a wiring loom for like two grand. Now, because this ECU is to an automatic car, it needs to know which gear the gearbox is in before allowing it to start. So it needs to think it's in park or neutral. So this is a neutral safety switch. So we plug that in, spun it to park, and it started. Woo! Now that we have a running car, we need a driving car. And a driving car needs brakes, clutch, and a throttle. So we installed a pedal box. So that's going to be our setup. Ba -ba 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 -ba. We had to come back and address the steering knuckle issue. The engine would not fit in when the steering column attached and the manifold on. So we had to find a way around this and this took absolute weeks. I tried hitting the manifold. We made three custom steering knuckles. The only way I could get this in was to make my own manifold myself. And I'm not a welder, but sometimes you just got to give things a go and you've got to get it done. This is how it's ended up. Not the best welds in the world. But, I'm happy with that. So next we wanted to tackle the back end. So we removed the subframe, we took the diff out so we could weld it. We changed the rear drums to disc and calipers. And we actually got a custom subframe made by Restofab, which would allow us to do toe and camber adjustment. And we strengthened the whole subframe because we were going through coilover and we poly bushed the whole rear end too. Now with the manifold and the steering knuckle issue fixed, the engine is probably going to be going in for the final time quite soon. So I thought now would be a good time to do a timing belt. Before the engine goes in, we've actually got quite a few jobs to do. And one of those was making all of the brake lines. We made all the hard lines ourselves. And where the flexes would go, we used braided line and we got those made at a shop around the corner. At the same time, we actually installed the hydro and we ran all the lines to from the hydro and to the clutch with the braided line as well. Now it was actually time to put the engine and the gearbox in the car to try to make the gearbox fit now. Now my gearbox never came with a shifter so I wanted to make sure I knew how the shifter worked before I actually put the gearbox in. Now I actually had to do quite a lot of fabrication to actually get the gearbox mount to fit this tunnel and also quite a lot of fabbing to make the shifter work. This was probably the most questionable part of the build I've done as it wasn't the cleanest but it works really well so can you argue with it? You cannot. Now it's time to start making the car like an actual car. So we actually got some fiberglass doors with the car. So we're gonna actually install them and we're also gonna install a set of bucket seats as well. Cars actually have windows. So we actually installed a full Lexan window kit as well. This was a pain. I would not recommend someone doing this. It takes ages and it's messy because you've got to use Tiger Seal. Now we actually removed the mechanical power steering pump off the engine and we want to run an electric one. So this is a power steering pump off a Vauxhall Astra and we put it inside the car just to take some more weight away from the engine bay. We've actually got some custom power steering lines made and they run all the way through the car, under the car, to the steering rack. So we've got fuel, ignition, brakes, steering. The only thing from stopping this car from driving is a prop shaft, so we've got a custom one made. Go into first gear. Let's make the clutches work. And it should turn this wheel. But now, when I let go of the clutch, yes! So we started doing all the external wiring. So this was a battery and actually running all the fuses and the relays for the power steering pump and the fuel pump as well. Now it was actually ready for the first drive. My trapper was hanging out and I couldn't find a replacement, but I was eager to drive it. We're moving. <laughs> <laughs> now the next day we got a new track rod and I experienced one of the happiest days I've had in a very very long time.
So now the car's driving, we need to start getting it looking presentable. So we've got a full wide body kit with the car and we're gonna install that. Now this is another one of those super messy jobs and I would not recommend doing it. I actually had to do this twice because the first time around I didn't cut it high enough and it was gonna hit the new wheels when I got them on. Now I want this car weighing as little as possible. I actually want it to be under a thousand kilos. So we've installed a Kevlar roof, a fiberglass bonnet and also a fiberglass bumper as well. So we've got a full set of custom coilovers made by Gaz Shocks. These are two-way adjustability and these are like one of the highest end coilovers they do. And we actually sent these away to Wizards of Lock. So we've got a full lock kit for the E30 as well. So we've got some custom made arms. You can see them in the background there. And they've modified the hubs as well. So we should be able to get some nice angle. And to tie up the front suspension, we've got two new wheel bearings and we've got some discs and pads as well. So after finishing up the car with a set of harnesses, we're going to take it to my good friend, Oliver Evans. He's built all of his drift cars before, uh, and I wanted another set of eyes just to make sure everything was all right. Hey, you're, you're on the slippery slope now. I know, mate. I've, I've always done a spreadsheet of how much I've spent on don't, that. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't. I know, I, I started doing that as well, but that's, uh, yeah, you get lost with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you start lying to yourself as well, so yeah, just don't do it. Now, very kindly, Ollie looked over everything, and the main thing that we both agreed on was we didn't like the radiator. My radiator is worrying me as well. Yeah, I don't like that at all. So very kindly, Ollie spent his afternoon making my radiator a bit more presentable. So you see it tucked away there behind the crash bar now. It looks neater. I've actually got a bigger fan on there as well. Ollie did say we still might have some overheating issues, but obviously we'll have to just figure that out if the day comes. <laughs> And that being that, we're on it. We're on to the final jobs, which is tying up. So this is my dashboard. I don't need anything. All I need to know basically is water temp. And we're going to put oil pressure and voltage on there as well. So I just made this dash out of carbon fiber. And we're just tidying up where all the wiring sits as well. I've tidied up all my fuel lines and all my power steering lines. So these are all peaklit along the tunnel now, all the way back to wherever they go. And the final thing is actually putting the car back together. As you can see, we've got a windscreen fitted and we've got the grills on, we've got the bumper on and it's starting to look like a finished project. And this is where my real excitement starts coming in. Feeling good right now. We can, that means we can get it painted. Right, look how sick it's gonna be. Oh my God. And after buying some spicy wheels. Oh yeah, damn baby. And then trying to fit some 225s and a 10 and a half, Jay. Then giving up and buying some 245s and still struggling to get them on, we have to give them to the tie shop next door. We actually took the car down to Protec Smart to get painted. Kuba paints all my cars, he's amazing at what he does, and we've chose a Porsche colour for the third time in a row. Now we went with Porsche Racing Yellow, and I'm not going to lie, yellow is my least favourite colour, and when he was spraying it down, I was really worried I wasn't going to like it. I'm really scared. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm trusting you, bro. I'm trusting you. <laughs> I'm trusting you. <laughs> and I'm glad I did trust it because this is how the car came out. It's hard to get the colour across on camera. It is a little bit darker. It does look a little bit like this in person. We still got a lot of fitment to do with the wheels, but I need to change some springs to be able to drop the car a little bit more. But it looks sick. So here is a walk round of the car. It looks sick. I'm way happier than what I first was when it was in the booth. There are obviously some things that we need to change. Um, obviously, I, I knew this. I knew obviously this car is always going to be a bit of a test car. Uh, some bigger space on the front. Uh, this kit is like plus 70 mil. It's absolutely huge. So we need to um, we need to go go wider on the back. Uh, we definitely need some side skirts. The way the car looks, I think, is awesome. Now it looks great, but the next big question, will it work? Well, we go to a drift day the next day to find out. The first time drifting the E30. Oh my God, oh my God.
Now, thank you to everybody who's either watched the full build in this car or who's watched this 15 minute recap. This 15 minute recap does not go anywhere near into the extent of the work that's gone into this car. It's took five to six months of fabbing and it's just took so long and I'm so glad we're here. This has always been a dream of mine to build a V8 E30 and I've done it all from scratch myself. So thank you everybody who's been watching. This isn't the end of this journey. We've still got a few more things to do to the car, but the bulk of it is done. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.